so you have to be careful um, to read everything and think about everything twice. So here is a question that I had. What if it happens that each time I add just one element to my set? It looks like this will be n elements long. How is it possible? What is the maximal, uh, how many, what is the maximal path for every element in this case? Uh, how many times I have to look for the label. How about uh, uh, element here? Say I started with a single element here. Um, and it happens that we chose its uh, label for the label of these two and so forth. And each time we add a single element, so this label will persist. What, where will the pointer for this element point to? What will at the end? Hmm? Yeah, union find. So say this is an element, say this is five, uh, this is seven, and then here I have two elements, and I decide because they are all equal size, doesn't matter, I'll keep the label five, then I add element eight, it's one element and two elements uh, here. I'll keep the same label here and change this to five. So this element, where its pointer points at at the end? At itself, right? Because his label, its label never changed. How many, what's the length of uh, pointers uh, uh, what is the path for each other element? One. Just one, right? Once it points to five, that's it, right? It will stay with the same label. So in this case, there will be five will point to itself and everyone else will point to five, right? So all search will be actually constant time, even though it looks like a, a long chain, okay. I forgot to mention another important application. Uh, so you have a K clustering problem. And the idea is the following. Assume, what's K clustering? Well, uh, assume that I have a bunch of points in the plane. Okay. A tree clustering will be splitting these uh, points in three sets uh, so that the distance between, minimal distance between any two clusters is as large as possible. Because what is clustering? We want to kind of keep the parts as much apart as possible, right? So here in advance you are given, say, uh, I give you three I give you number three and I want three clustering and I give you coordinates of all points. How would you find the three clusters? Sorry? So first thing that you can do is you can make a complete graph, right, with the edges that correspond to distances between points, right? So a complete graph with edges that correspond to, what can we do now? Well, it's not clear whether the largest can be used because, yeah. Uh, well, for any two points, you can find the distance between them. So in the corresponding graph, yes, between any two points, the edge, the, le the weight of the edge is just Euclidean distance between points. Let me give you a hint. Uh, it's essentially the classical theorem, but what do we do? Yes? Exactly. Brilliant. Uh, 
So you simply run the classical algorithm for producing minimum spanning tree. But you stop not when you have just one component, you stop when you have three components. Right? So you just abort the classical algorithm once your union find detects only three distinct labels. Right? And then, of course, the minimal distance will be precisely equal to what? What is in, uh, so you ran uh, your classical theory, your classical algorithm, and you stopped here. That's the first edge you didn't add because here you produced exactly k uh, distinct labels, k sets. Uh, what is the minimal distance between the k clusters? Uh, Exactly, it's the next edge, right? So you see a small modification of, uh, and clustering is extremely important in many algorithms in artificial intelligence and in all sorts of places. Okay, very good. So please read, the, this is tricky material, so please read the, uh, the textbook because it's really amazingly nicely written. It's a real pleasure to read it, unlike most of other computer science books. Okay, so let's do a few problems. Let's start uh, with simple stuff like binary search. So this is your problem. So, Consider the following equation, x to the 8 uh, minus x to the 4th, y to the 4th equals y to the 6th plus x squared, y squared plus 10. And uh, you are given two sets, each with n elements. So you have a set A and a set B. And your task is in time n log n to determine if you can pick x from A and y from B so that this equation is satisfied. So the question is, does this equation have a solution so that x belongs to A? and B belongs to Y, and each has N elements. How would you solve this problem? Sort yeah. So sort first B. So sort B. What do we do next? Well... Mm hmm So, well, if you sort them together, you have to keep track who comes from where, right? So, but you are on the right track. Uh, you can try with all, you arrange with x through all elements of A, and you sort B. But uh, say you try the middle element, and this... Uh, Equality fails. What do you do next? So you move to the left or to the right, but uh, what do you compute if uh, if I increase uh, x? Uh, this if y is large, this might increase faster than that. that it might decrease this. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. And then you should be able to see if the equation is you know, increasing or decreasing. Oh, so you want to, so you want to be able to binary search, but you see this is not monotonic. But the idea is if you move this to the other side, so if you write it as x to the eight equals x to the fourth, y to the fourth plus y to the sixth plus x squared, y squared, plus 10. Now, 
if you fix x and you compute value of this side and you try for say y that belongs to that is the median of b the midpoint of b and uh, assume that it happens that this is too large would you look for larger values in b no because this everything being positive this monotonically increases uh, in y so if one value of y is too large all the larger values will be too large so and if this is too small or smaller values if this is smaller than x to the i smaller values of y will not work so each time you get only one half of the array to test but the trick was to make this monotonically increasing for y to have this property that um, okay so this is simple binary search uh, let me let's do a little bit of divide and conquer so assume that you have two to the n integers and what you want to do is you want to find the largest and the second largest number using only 2 to the n plus n minus 2 comparisons so let's see okay so you have two to the n integers uh, and you want to find max and uh, how shall we write it second max <laughs> uh, the second largest uh, using only two to the n plus n minus too many comparisons how would you do this Mm -hmm. and uh, you can pair the first half with the second half well how do you uh, compare the whole first half with the second half so the idea is split it in two equal parts yeah. but how do you compare you mean every element from the left every element to the right that would be too many because you have two to the n minus one elements in each half the number of pairs would be this squared that goes overboard. Can we just keep track of max and second max? So how are we going to Well, that's so the the question is uh, um, can you do it really this way? So you are saying uh, we keep track. And which then, one max, which one is second max, and then we take the third one, and if it is higher than max, we have take max. If it is okay, so how many comparisons will that be? Many. That's two to the n minus one times two. No, it would be two to the n minus one times two. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, this goes overboard. So the idea to keep track of max and second max and compare each element with the two, there are too many of them, right? Because you are making two comparisons per step. Does this expression remind you of something that you had on homework? Yeah. What was it? Celebrity problem. How do you, did you solve the celebrity problem? We start by doing pairwise comparisons, uh, right? And uh, we keep track only of max, yeah. right? So then you compare this, and you compare this, and then you have one comparison here. 
Here the number of comparisons is 2 to the n minus 1. Here the comparison is 1. Sum total is 2 to the n minus 1 many comparisons. So now you have only n minus 1 many comparisons to find the second max. How do you find the second largest now? Hmm? Exactly, so the only place where the second largest can be, if this was the winner, if this was the largest, then can this element that dropped be the second largest? No, the only possibility is either this, or it's either this, but none of these can be, right? Or maybe this one. So on each of uh, n minus 1 many layers, you have uh, only one candidate and uh, you, the, you pick the, second, the largest among these n minus 1 and that will be your uh, second largest. So divide and conquer. Okay, here is a very nice one. So, assume, so the topic is obviously divide and conquer. So, assume that I give you a board that is of size 2 to the n times 2 to the n, right? Looks like this, and then like this. and so forth, and one square is missing, okay? And uh, you, get, you get a weird kind of dominoes that are like this. Your task is to cover the entire board without overlap except for the hole. How would you solve this problem? It looks like a puzzle, but it's actually an extremely good example of divide and conquer. If it's divide and conquer, what do you suggest we do? Split this halfway this way and halfway this way. And lo and behold, we got a board that is half the size, so you can run your recursive algorithm on this part, but these guys have no holes. So you cannot apply the recursive procedure. How do you, what do you do? Um, so you start with a two by two square, you put the L in that, and then you put three other squares in it, and you set up well, we want a recursive divide and conquer recursive. So how would you how would you make this applicable? How would you make the algorithm applicable to these three pieces? Okay. So you divide down um, so you would quarter it down into a two by two. Right? And then oh, sorry, sorry, what do you do by two by two? I don't know. Okay, so this is divided, so what is the next move? You divide it again. Well, but you have to call recursively your algorithm. And yeah, yes? You remove um, the, like, the point they all join, but then removing one from each Exactly, brilliant. So then you put one domino at smack at the center. Right? So now, you treat these guys as holes, each is a hole in the appropriate quarter, and you can now recursively apply your algorithm both on this, on this, this, and this. Right, so putting a domino at the very center so that the hole of the domino is where the hole here is, allows you to reduce this problem 
to the previous problem in which you have a board of half the size with exactly one hole. And now you do it recursively, right? So that's an... Well, we prove it. So the question is how do we know uh, that uh, we can, to, that it will eventually produce a result? Well, first of all, as a homework exercise, show that uh, uh, 2 to the n uh, squared minus 1 is divisible by 3. But uh, this follows from this uh, algorithm. Let's see, let's prove by induction, right? If, uh, so the size is 2 to the n. What if n is equal to 1? Well, then I have 4 by, f I mean 2 by 2 with one hole, well, exactly one domino will suffice. Assume that this is true for some n, and let's prove it's true for n plus 1. But if it's uh, uh, 2 to the n plus 1 can be partitioned in these four sides, to each of them the inductive hypothesis applies, because it's a right a board of size 2 to the n with a single hole. Ergo, by induction, it also holds for n plus 1. You see, it's, if you imagine it, if you imagine how this would work, we would do precisely what this gentleman suggests. Split it until you get... Well, actually, it's better if you see it just this way because, you see, that's the, uh, the thing about the recursion. Trivial recursion step can hide horrendous complexity. Do you know what, I think it's called NIM. Uh, you know this, I think it's Vietnamese puzzle. You have three sticks and you have... The towers of Hanoi, right. And you have to move them from one stick to another stick. But you are never allowed to put larger um, disk on a smaller disk. If you try to describe, say, for four or five what to do, it's a nightmare. But uh, the solution is uh, absolutely trivial by recursion. How would you prove uh, uh, by recursion? Uh, how, what would the recursive argument uh, proceed? Uh, how? So here it is how it works by recursion. It's, the description is trivial. And it's really shocking because if you try to do it, uh, it's just mind-bogglingly complicated, but the a recursion is trivial. So here is the stick, and you have uh, n many disks. And here is another stick, and here is another stick. And assume you need to move all of the disks uh, here. Here is a recursion. By applying the algorithm for n minus 1 disks, Move these n minus 1 disks here, leaving the large, largest one here. That's trivial by recursion. Just ignore the bottom. You have n minus 1. Recursively, you can move them all here. Then move the largest one here. And then again, by recursion, you can move all of these here. Trivial, right? So it's just f of uh, uh, n minus 1 uh, with the, the role of b equal instead of c, then move one disk here, and then f of n minus 1 with the role of a here and the role of c here. So this is the power of recursion, simple recursive step can produce extraordinarily complicated algorithms. Okay, so how about a little bit of polynomial multiplication? I hear you love that. Huh? 
how would you multiply the following two polynomials? Uh, a0 plus a2x squared plus a4x to the fourth plus a6x to the sixth. So this is p of x and q of x is equal to b0 plus b2 um, x squared plus b4 x to the 4 plus b6 x to the 6 plus b8 x to the 8. And you have to do it with at most 8 large number multiplications. How would you solve this problem? What is the degree of the product? Uh, 16. 14. How many values would you need? 15 values, because to uniquely determine a polynomial of degree n, you need n plus 1 many values. But 15 values would require 15 multiplications, and you have only 8. How would you fix that problem? They are all even numbers, so what do I do? X squared is equal to Y, so consider P prime of Y, which is A0 plus A2Y plus A4Y squared plus A6Y cubed, and then Q prime of Y will be B0 plus da 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 plus uh, B6Y cube plus b8 y to the fourth. How many multiplications do you need to multiply these two guys? Uh, eight. eight multiplications because you need only eight values. So you would evaluate these polynomials at which points? Well, uh, this is rather than roots of unity, you can get by much cheaper here. You can do it from, say, minus 2. Minus 3 to 3. Minus 3 to 3, that's 7. And you need another one, you can choose any values, distinct values would, uh, uh, would work. So you see a simple, and then, of course, once you find the product, you replace everywhere y by x squared. And if you had something like if you had y cubed and you replace it with x squared cubed, this is, of course, just x to the sixth without any multiplications, right? Only multiplications of coefficients count. Okay. How would you multiply, a how would you square a complex number with only three multiplications? In fact, believe it or not, this is what... Um, Gauss, I think, was doing to re when people were computing things by hand. So if you have A plus IB squared, what is this? Well, this is A plus IB uh, squared is equal to uh, A squared uh, plus 2I uh, a, B, and then minus B squared, because I squared is minus 1. So here is one multiplication, but it looks like you need altogether 1, 2, 3, not 2. That would be a lot of computations to get into a polar form. But there is a simple tweak here to get this guy with only two multiplications. How? <laughs> Difference of two squares. Brilliant. This is equal to a squared minus b squared plus 2i 
a b which is equal a plus b times a minus b plus 2i a b. So here is one multiplication. So this is all essentially the Karatsuba trick, right? When you don't need individual parts, but just the whole expression. Okay, here is a nice, that just tests whether you have a clue what roots of unity are. So how would you find all k's that satisfy the following? I times omega 64 to the power 13 times omega 32 to power 11 uh, equals omega, omega 64 to the power k. How would you find, uh, describe all k's that satisfies this equation, that satisfy this equation? What's the annoying element here that uh, i? How do you get rid of i? Well, something, God knows what would happen with, but what is i? How, what root of unity is i? What order of root of unity is i? i is equal omega with what index? What order? Four, right? So i is simply omega four, right? This is i. What? This is omega four because you have four equidistant points. So this is actually omega four times omega 64 to 13 times omega 32 to the 11. How do I multiply roots of unity when they don't have the same basis but they are divisible? Common largest, Common largest right? So this will be Omega 64 to what power? What power do I have to take omega 64 to get omega 4? 16. Right, because by constellation lemma, I can divide top and bottom by 16 and I get omega 4. Times omega 64 to 13 times omega 64 to what power here? If I, this is 64, what should be on top? <coughs> I multiply both by 2, so it's 22. So you get that this is just omega 64 to the power, okay, let's see, 16, 13, 22, 5 and 6, 11, and 1, so this is 3 and 2, 51, if I didn't mess up anything. And this has to be equal to omega 64 to the power k. So what is k? 61 plus 64 multiplied omega. It is, uh, k is 50, uh, 51 plus uh, 64 k. For, I mean, sorry, m for any integer m. Okay, ah, here is a real, real neat one. So there won't be anything on the exam that will require some exorbitant calculation. So just think what you are asked to do and uh, do not rush. Okay, here is another before we move to the next, uh, how would you multiply these two polynomial? P of x equals a0 plus a100 x to 100 and P, oh, sorry, Q of x equals b0 plus b100 
x to 100. How many multiplications do you have to perform to find the product p of x times q of x? What's the degree of the product? 200, right? So you just need to evaluate this at uh, 201 numbers and So this is essentially multiplication. We can replace x to the 100 by y, and then you have two linear polynomials. And, then there, will be three and there will be three multiplications. Can you tell me without any uh, kind of uh, complication what are the three multiplications that you would do? A0 plus a100 times b0 plus b100. That's one multiplication. And a0, b0, and a100, b100 is the third, is the second. So altogether, three multiplications, because if you multiply this together and subtract these two, you will get precisely the coefficient that goes in front of x to 100. OK. How about this one? You are asked to represent the following polynomial in coefficient form. So p of x equals x minus omega 64 times x minus omega 64, uh, sorry, to the power 0, to the power 1, x minus omega 64 to the power 2, all the way to x minus omega 64 to the power 63. What is the coefficient representation of this polynomial? If you write it as a so suggestion is uh, maybe we can evaluate this uh, at roots of unity of order 64. What is uh, p of uh, what is p of omega 64 to any power k, zero. that's equal to 0. Good. But this will be, what degree is this polynomial? 64. 64. So you would need 65 values, and here you have only 64. But what is the polynomial whose roots are precisely roots of unity of order 64? Hmm? What is the poly what is a root of unity of order 64? What is its main property? Exactly. So um, x to the power 64 is equal to one, right? Which means uh, x to the power 64 minus one is equal to 0. So what are the roots of this polynomial? Precisely the roots of unity. So if two polynomials have exactly the same roots, they can differ only by a multiplicative constant, right? What is the leading coefficient of this polynomial? 1. What's the leading coefficient of this polynomial? 1. So that's your guy, right? So without, just by figuring out that the roots of this polynomial are precisely the same roots as p of x, and because the leading coefficients are also equal, if two polynomials share the same roots and the same leading coefficient, they are one and the same polynomial. So don't rush into some complicated calculations. 
as I said, you will be tested for just understanding the material. Okay, do you remember what a convolution is? What is a convolution of two sequences? How, what is the definition of a convolution of two sequences? What did we say? How is it defined? How is it related to multiplication of polynomials? Say if you have a sequence A0 up to A, um, say whatever, A15, and a sequence B0 up to B, say, um, 31. What, how do we define convolution of these two sequences? We simply form the corresponding two polynomials. So P of x is equal to A0 plus A1x plus A15x to the 15. And polynomial Q of x, which is equal to B0 plus B1x plus, plus B31 x to the 31. How the, so the convolution of these two sequences is which sequence related to these two polynomials? It's just the coefficients, so P, uh, sorry, I say this is sequence A, this is sequence B, A convolved with B, is just the sequence of coefficients C0 up to C, which will it be, 46, where these are the coefficients of what? Of the product of these two polynomials. Okay, and what's the main feature of convolution? Uh, how do we evaluate convolution? We find the discrete Fourier transform of the first sequence, discrete Fourier transform of the second sequence. We multiply the point wise, and then we invert. And this is doable in time. What time? N log N. So if you get the following problem. So let's guess, assume you have to find the coefficients of the following, you have to evaluate the following sequence. So uh, you have to find the sequence f of 0, f of 1, f of m. Um, OK, up to f of 2n, right, which so that f of m is defined as sum when i plus j equals to m and i and j range between 0 and, uh, uh, and uh, n minus, and n of, uh, let me see, of log uh, j plus 2 to the power i. So, and you have to do it in n log n time. How would you do? So, look, there are two n many of them, and each of them is a longish sum. I mean, m can range all the way up to 2n. So if you did it by brute force, it would be quadratic. How would you compute this sequence in time n log n? What is this sequence? Let me give you a little hint. How can I simplify this log of this to a power? 
Exactly. So this is, uh, this is, oh, sorry, here is i plus 1, I think. i plus 1. So this is uh, uh, i plus 1 times log of j plus 2. So look. Now, i plus j sum to m, and then you have these products. How is this related to this convolution? This is convolution of which two sequences? Exactly. So that's the sequence uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, all the way to... Uh, to n plus 1, and the second sequence is uh, log 2, log 3, all the way to log n plus 2. And this is, now this is nothing but the convolution of these two sequences. So how do you evaluate it simple, uh, fast? You make a polynomial whose coefficients are these, another polynomial whose coefficients are those, and you evaluate these polynomials in the roots of unity of appropriate order, multiply the discrete Fourier transform and invert, and you get the, uh, the convolution. It's not, in, if you have something like this on the exam, you can just say, since the convolution, convolution is computed by computing the discrete Fourier transform of these sequences, multiplying them point by point and inverting, which takes time and log n. So, as you can see, um, uh, you can evaluate various uh, sums by reducing them to a convolution. Okay, we continue tomorrow. Tomorrow we do just a whole bunch of greedy algorithms and then try to solve whatever we didn't do here, try to solve by yourselves. <laughs>